Okay, I think all of the technology is now technologized. Um, nice. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome everybody who's um, kind of filtering in. Um, make sure everybody's getting in all right. Cool, cool. okay. People continue to join, but I'm going to go ahead and get us started here. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're excited to host this discussion about the role food plays in movements for social change. Uh, so Firestorm's a 14-year-old radical bookstore um, that's uh, owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. We strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. Um, and we're also committed to continuing to do these events um, online and soon, I think, uh, as a hybrid uh, experience, um, both because uh, we really love to be able to connect with folks at a distance, and we know that COVID continues to be a pretty major barrier for a lot of folks in our community. So we do events regularly, and over the next month, we'll be doing um, uh, events on several topics that might be interesting to folks who are here tonight, including uh, the emerging alliance between anti-trans feminists and the far right, uh, the history of anti-racist action, the lives of sex workers, um, plus continuing an online reading group on Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. So lots of great feminist content. Um, if you're interested in any of those events uh, and you wanna sign up for them, uh, uh, you can check out our social media where we post about events or follow a link that I'll put in the chat for our calendar. So please note that tonight we're using Zoom's Q&A tool. Uh, if you want to ask a question at any point, uh, you can just go ahead and uh, send it to us. You can find the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, or if you're on uh, Facebook, you can just use the comment section below the stream. So let's get started. Uh, tonight, we're joined by two fantastic writers, Ren Arai, editor of Nourishing Resistance, Stories of Food, Protest, and Mutual Aid, and Alex Ketchum, author of Ingredients for Revolution, A History of American Feminist Restaurants, Cafes, and Coffee Houses. Thanks so much for being here. Dr. Alex Ketchum is the uh, faculty lecturer uh, of the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies at McGill University. She's the director um, of the Just Feminist Tech and Scholarship Lab. Her work integrates food, environmental, technological, and gender history. She's the uh, author of Engage in Public Scholarship, a guidebook on feminist and accessible communication, how to DIY a feminist restaurant, and how to organize inclusive events. A handbook for feminists. Ren Arai is a writer, editor, and archivist whose work ranges from researching and writing about the role of food in labor strikes, mutual aid projects, and revolt, to helping with community uh, dinners at their local collectively run social center. They've written about food for publications including The Rumpus, Enthropy, and Blind Field, a journal of cultural inquiry and have facilitated various culinary writing classes, including garden poetry for first graders and a community workshop on queer food writing. Most recently, they've been digging through radical labor and zine archives to find materials related to food and cooking and are learning to build archives on their own and in collaboration with others. So thanks so much, uh, Alex and Ren, for being here tonight. Uh, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. I think it is sort of at the intersection of several of my interests. And then also, um, I think is a good one for Firestorm for multiple reasons. Uh, Ren used to live in Asheville and um, spent a lot of time around uh, Firestorm folks and at Firestorm. Um, so it's really sweet and lovely to be able to have you join us with your book. Um, and then uh, Alex, it's also cool to see Firestorm get a mention in your book. Uh, so that was fun when it first got here opening up the index and like flipping through to every page where Firestorm was mentioned, <laughs> often alongside Blue Stockings, um, who are, you know, fantastic and wonderful. We love to see, see them there too. So uh, yeah, I don't know, this kind of hits home in a lot of ways tonight. 
Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pass off to Alex to share a little bit uh, about um, about her book. Thank you so much, Liberty, for that really kind introduction. And I'm so happy to be here. And thank you, everyone who's listening on Zoom and on Facebook. I'm joining you from Jojoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. And while we're in virtual space, it's really important that we always remember that even the servers hosting our events are still connected to physical land and space. And the reason I want to begin with thinking through space is because my book, Ingredients for Revolution, uh, speaks a lot about what it means to create feminist space and the role food has in that work. So I'm really happy to be speaking alongside Ren, whose work does an amazing job of connecting these themes as well. So I'm going to give a little bit of background about my book, how I got into it, and the kind of format. I'm only going to be speaking for about 12, 13 minutes, um, so we have lots of time for discussion. But this project focuses on the history of American feminist restaurants, cafes, and coffee houses from 1972 to 2022, so a 50 year period. And I started this project actually back in 2011 when I was an undergrad at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. I was one of the co organizers of the school's organic farm, Long Lane. I had founded the Food Politics Living Community Farmhouse, which still exists today, and about 15 students will live there at any time of the year. And I was taking feminist studies classes, history classes, and I was really interested in connecting my interest in food and feminism together. And I first started thinking about a lot of the work that feminists in the 1970s were doing, thinking about uh, unremunerated domestic food production. So basically um, doing all the kind of labor of cooking and cleaning without being paid and how important that reproductive labor was for keeping the economy going. And there are lots of writings about this topic. Simultaneously, I was looking at what was really big, especially around kind of 2010, 2011, with the slow food movement. And I was excited by some of their principles, but in a lot of their marketing, promotion, and events, it would show kind of gender in a very binary way, but also it'd be men kind of farming the fields and women cooking. And so I want to kind of historicize that relationship, think about it more. And while I was working on this project, some folks said, hey, have you ever heard of Bloodroot? And what they're referring to was Bloodroot Feminist Vegetarian Restaurant and Bookstore in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I convinced a friend to drive me the 40 minutes there. And immediately I was just hooked. I was fascinated. And so um, part of that undergrad work, I wrote a little bit about Bloodroot. I also had the chance to uh, visit the Schlesinger archive, um, which is part of Harvard, and look at some of the stuff from Bread and Roses, which was also a feminist restaurant, but located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I also went down to Sally Bingham archives at Duke in North Carolina. And I found out more about like other kind of confluences of food and feminism. Uh, I continued to be really excited by this question of what it meant to be a feminist restaurant. I moved up to Canada and um, to Quebec and was looking at Canadian feminist restaurants. And then I did my PhD uh, on American and Canadian feminist restaurants. And the book we're talking about today is focused on the U.S. context. So what is a feminist restaurant? I wasn't interested in being really prescriptive with the way I was defining feminism, because those of you probably know that there's a lot of debates about different kinds of feminism. You know, there's socialist feminism, anarchist feminisms, Marxist feminisms, liberal feminisms, eco-feminisms, uh, lesbian radical separatist feminisms, lots of different types. And I didn't want to be in the position of saying, this restaurant embodies feminist values and this one doesn't. Rather, I was interested in restaurants who actually call themselves feminist in either their title, in their marketing, in their advertisements, things they produced, or in oral histories. And so uh, when I started to look into this, you know, I knew about Bloodroot, I knew about Bread and Roses, and I had heard about Mother Courage, which was the first feminist restaurant I could find in the United States, founded in 1972 in New York City. Um, I knew about those spaces, but I really wanted to find more. Um, and I did this by uh, a lot of different methods, actually. Part of it was I went through um, every uh, lesbian and feminist and kind of women's uh, archive, women's movement archive and LGBTQ archive in the U.S. and Canada. I contacted all of them and asked like what they had, because it's not something that really shows up normally in finding aids. 
I went through um, pretty much every edition of the Gaia's Guide or Gaia's Guide, which were women's travel guides. Um, women was code in that language for like queer and questioning and lesbian women. Um, I also went through the Dameron's Gay Guides, the Dameron's Women Traveler, lots of different kind of local regionalized guides. I did oral histories. I went through thousands of issues of feminist periodicals, lesbian periodicals, uh, queer periodicals um, in their articles and advertisement sections. I really got a lot out of ephemera sections and archives uh, because there would be sometimes a business card or a poster. I looked at the tour schedules of traveling performers that were part of like the women's mu music movement, which was basically, again, kind of a code uh, for lesbian. And so through this work, I was able to assemble lists of around 230 spaces. Um, and in 2013, I first launched the initial version of the directory on my website, The Feminist Restaurant Project, and I invited folks to tell me what's missing, like where can I find out more, um, are there other places I should look at, and that was one way I kind of found out about other spaces. Through that, I built different versions of my maps over time, and uh, it's kind of color-coded. There's ones I'm sure were feminist restaurants, cafes, and coffee houses, and ones that might have been. The it's a pretty simple color coding, but it's because sometimes all I had was the name in a directory or a business card, so I can't verify. And, you know, uh, I talk about the book is divided into three parts. So the first part is about feminist restaurants and cafes. The second part's about coffee houses. And the third part's about these spaces from after 1989. Um, and so the reason it's divided in that way is because when I was looking at feminist restaurants, it meant that it was people who were able to secure financing in order to lease a space or buy a space, right? So even when I'm talking about a feminist who are women, oftentimes lesbians, and oftentimes Jewish, but not all were Jewish, right? There's already They're already facing a lot of barriers in order to have the money to operate a restaurant um, with stability. This also meant that um, like prior to the passage of the Equal Cry Opportunity Act in 1974, it was even harder. Um, and so this meant even greater barriers for women of color, who are lesbians and feminists, oftentimes from working class roots trying to start these spaces. So you see most of the spaces that were restaurants and cafes were founded by white women and Jewish women. Not all, but many. But I wasn't just interested in this question of how food built community and um, fostered a larger sense of um, solidarity and political activism within like white feminist movements. And by looking at coffee houses, which is the second part of the book, I was able to look at a, a larger diversity of founders of these spaces because coffee houses, I know that sometimes like a restaurant will call itself a cafe and a place that sells coffee will sometimes call itself a coffee house, right? Like it's kind of difficult to differentiate between these terms, but the way I'm using coffee house in the sense of the book is what we would kind of call a pop-up today, or just, you know, it'd be like recurring or sometimes one-off um, events which would have coffee and sometimes tea, sometimes snacks, and there would be dances and music and socializing. So because they didn't need a permanent lease or to own the space, this opened up opportunities for a greater number of people to participate. The book from the first two parts of the book are really focused on 1972 to 1989, because even though I don't like the kind of framing of second wave feminism of this kind of wave metaphor, which has problems because it really maps on to kind of white women's involvement in uh, feminist movements. I was 1972 is when the first one was founded and I wasn't ready to really get into the 1990s because feminism is transforming in different ways, but many of the places that were founded in the seventies and eighties kind of start to close by 1989. The third part of the project really looks at the kind of uh, arrival of these new uh, feminist spaces, many founded uh, throughout the 2000s, and there's a particular upswell um, around 2015, uh, 2016, when uh, former President Donald Trump was trying to gain popularity, and there's this real motivation to 
really mark a space as explicitly feminist. And because I was looking at places that were marking themselves as explicitly feminist, this is when you start to see more kind of coming up again. Um, to be clear, there's lots of places that are social justice restaurants, um, anarchist restaurants, but I'm really looking at places that are markedly calling themselves feminist restaurants. Um, the book looks at how these restaurants fostered community, uh, supporting musicians, artists, uh, plumbers, um, electricians, people in the trades, uh, speakers would go from place to place and so forth. So it's really a, also a history of this kind of feminist culture at that period and tells the history of um, feminism at that time, like some aspects of it that aren't always covered. It speaks to this kind of tension that we sometimes see between food and feminism Although I found many of the restaurants weren't necessarily responding to that initial question that I had about um, dealing with unpaid work within the home, uh, but they were more using food as a way to create community. I talk about definitions of feminist food, which I'm happy to talk about more. I'm just trying to be mindful of the time. So I hope we kind of jump into those questions more of what makes food feminist. Um, and yeah, and I also really am interested in the ways that feminist restaurants have changed over time. So they tend to become move from kind of an emphasis on lesbian space to queer space. They tend to be um, thinking more gender inclusively. Um, it's not, not to say that all the spaces in the 70s and 80s were trans exclusive because they weren't, but they tend to over time become more trans inclusive as a whole. Um, and there's kind of a move towards um, multi-revenue streams of selling not just food, but also books and like other things to kind of create a bit more um, stability. So that's been 12 minutes. <laughs> so there's so much more we can talk about, but I want to give space um, for Ren so we can also have um, a robust conversation. So thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Alex. I am really excited to get to ask you a few questions about your book in a little while. I loved it so much. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about this anthology I edited. You can kind of see it. It's called Nourishing Resistance, Stories of Food, Protest, and Mutual Aid. Um, and it is over 20 different pieces, mostly essays and articles, but there's one poem and there's one short story um, from all over the world. There's a concentration of stories from the United States, but we also have contributors from Canada. We have contributors from Argentina, um, South Africa, India. So sort of drawing on Hong Kong. So drawing on more of that international perspective as well. And just sort of asking this question of like, what role does food play within social movements, both today and historically? And I got interested in this work, um, like, like so many uh, folks who came up as young anarchists and punks, I started going to Food Not Bombs when I was in high school. Um, and Liberty and I were talking earlier that we, uh, went to the same Food Not Bombs chapter, which was the one at ABC No Rio in New York City. And I um, loved it and it got me really excited and really plugged into a bunch of other things, but I didn't really think specifically about the food aspect of it for a really long time. Um, it was more like, this is a cool, exciting thing to do. And now this can lead to like other things like books I wanna read or like protests I wanna go to, you know? Um, and then a few years later, I was working on a direct action campaign against mountaintop removal in Appalachia. I lived there for about a year and a half, and then I continued to work there pretty intensely for two more years. And one thing I would find myself doing often was helping to cook breakfast in the outdoor kitchen that we had. And it just seemed like I was continually being drawn to, to these spaces of cooking and these spaces of nourishment. Um, and... That's something that a few years later, um, when I was living in Tucson, which is where I live now, I really started chewing on and thinking about. Um, and so what I did was I started doing an interview series that was on a blog hosted by a friend. It's sadly now defunct, but the interview series is called Nourishing Resistance. And I started by contacting people that I knew. Um, I contacted my friend Cheshire, who's the first interview in the book. I contacted... Um, some of you, if you've been involved in like environmental movement work, you might know uh, Grumble, who is an amazing movement cook, whose piece, he was very, very busy. So it was hard to get his piece into the book. Um, but I will hopefully be able to like reprint that as a zine at some point or something like that. Um, 
And then from there, oh, and, and then I also started talking to people in Tucson that I knew. And from there, I would always ask, like, who else do you think I should talk to? And so that project grew until it was about 12 interviews. Um, and at that point in time, I started slowing down a little bit. There was a lot going on, but it was always sort of in the back of my mind to do something with those. Um, and then the opportunity arose to edit this anthology. I pitched it to PM Press and they picked it up. And I think that initially they anticipated that the anthology or like the initial conversation that happened um, between the person connecting us and PM Press mentioned that the anthology would mostly be these interviews. And I just thought, you know, like that would be awesome. But what if I just like pitched my dream anthology? What would happen then? Um, and so that's what I did. And so I pitched a project that would also include new writing and new work um, in addition to those. And they took it. And so um, from there, I invited all of the interviewees to either have their interview included or to write a new piece. So some of them you'll see as interviews and other ones of those interviewees have, have new pieces that they've written. Um, and then I also did a call for submissions, contacted people I knew, friends of friends, um, and then also a few pieces. I spent like months of my life just reading everything I could get my hands on. So there's some reprinted pieces that I just like fell in love with um, from various magazines and websites. And so it was sort of like a hodgepodge process where it was all being drawn from these different sources. But my goal was to put together an anthology that had a lot of different voices coming from a lot of different perspectives and places and talking about the many different ways that food um, is either a medium for social, social change in and of itself or as a part of protests and mutual aid movements. And I think that that might be all I have. So I'll pass it back to you, Liberty. Awesome. Thank you all so much for talking about your projects. I think reading both of your books, they cover really different territory in a lot of ways. I mean, different geographies, different time periods, different formats for the writing. Um, but they were great in conversation with each other because what comes through in both of them is y'all's passion for food research and like social movement archives. Um, and I think that makes them like a great pairing. Um, so I know that y'all have some questions for each other that you kind of brought some discussion <laughs> prompts. Um, I've got a few questions, uh, but why don't, um, Alex, if you wanted to kick us off just uh, with any any reflections or questions you might have um, related to, to Ren's book, I think we can kind of do an exchange of questions. For sure. So I think I'll start just like, saying like one thing that I see is kind of a confluence of our books. And then I have a question off of that. So I loved reading this book, folks who are listening, if you haven't read it yet, it's such a great resource. It covers so many different topics. And there were like a series of pieces in it that I was like, oh, this is speaking to these themes in my book. And oh, this is speaking to these themes and stuff. I look at like Nico's piece and Dawson mm -hmm. Collectives and um, Madeline's piece. Um, especially, right, because they're covering kind of queer food and working collectively and all of that. But the book itself seems to be also arranged kind of thematically, but it's not marked into separate sections. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. in terms of when you were organizing the book, if you have this kind of like internal structure that you're thinking in your head that you used to lay out, or if it's just that like I was seeing those kind of themes, like kind of like a section on queerness, a section on labor, a section on, you know, so forth. Totally. So I, I actually spent a lot of time in the order. I had this document and I would like change things constantly. Um, and one thing I've been doing some events, I did a, a book signing on Saturday and then we're having an event tomorrow um, with uh, Nelda Ruiz, who's one of the two other contributors who are from Tucson. And her piece is the last piece in the book. And I moved that piece from the front to the back, from the front to the back so many times. And I eventually decided that it just needed to be the note that the book ended on. Um, if you if you have a chance to pick up a copy, she ends on this incredible question that I that felt really important to have there. Um, so I did, yeah, I did spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. And it's funny that you notice that because there actually are sections and they're okay. just not marked as discrete ones because it felt like there was too much overlap to kind of have a heading. Um, so probably about the first half or the first third of the book is really talking about contemporary projects. Um, so things that are going on today or in the very recent past. And then, um, 
and, and in, in more of an article format, right? In more of talking about um, not necessarily from third person because so many of them are written by participants, but sort of in that more uh, direct nonfiction way, writing about, um, you know, how these projects came to be and what they do. And then um, there's a shift into kind of the more, maybe what I would say is the more personal. Um, and that's where a lot of those queer pieces come up, not because, you know, queer life and queer food isn't public, but because these pieces in particular felt like they had a bit of that personal edge that, you know, that story about food that happened in the author's life. Um, and then from there, shifting into histories, which I really nerded out about, um, I'm a huge history nerd. My dream in life is to be a historian someday. So um, that section was really fun to work on. And then I moved sort of into futures. So thinking about these um, last two pieces that were explicitly future looking and then Nelda's piece, which gestures at the past, but then like very um, intentionally moves toward the future. So. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. <laughs> I, I mean, I feel like yeah. you feel the like themes like going, but I did like totally. also not to mark them because it does allow the reader to then like make different connections in different ways versus being told them. So I thought that worked really, really effectively. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about, you know, you like talked about the structure earlier a bit and how some of it was based off of these interviews you did, but I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about how you think through your interview questions, kind of structuring mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. what you leave on the editing floor, or if it's all included, um, and how you dealt with it if it felt like people were talking not enough about food, or is it all about food even when it's not about food? Totally, yeah. So that the interviews are actually pretty edited. Um, and that editing was done in collaboration. So I would send a draft back to the person I interviewed. Chess's interview, Cheshire's, which is the first one, um, they actually wrote the whole thing. And so you can kind of feel that written style in it. Um, but, and I'm trying to think back because now I think it was like 2019, I did the last interview. But I had some questions that were the same, right? Like I always wanted to ask people what their favorite dish was because mm -hmm. I thought that that would really bring food to life. Whereas some of them were more specific and more related to the work that that each person was doing. Um, and I didn't, I don't worry too much about things. Like I can kind of be very loose and like, it's all about food, you know? So I didn't worry too much about that. I think it all kind of related um, in the end to that food theme. Yeah, or hopefully did. <laughs> and are you thinking of, like you're expanding your piece to be like a larger project in of itself, you know, cause you said about like your interest in mm, history and mm -hmm. stuff, like, is that kind of like the roots of a, a growing project or kind of an area you want to explore more? Um, I haven't thought specifically about that piece. Um, I just finished another short article that hasn't been published yet. That's about, um, I stumbled across the newsletters in the archives here at um, at the University of Arizona, where I'm a staff member of the Tucson Food Co-op, oh, and cool. which is now a very bougie, it's like an independent Whole Foods. But okay. at the time, um, back in the 70s when it was founded, it was super radical. And I actually thought a lot about that when I was reading your book, because you're working with the, a really similar time period of, mater of materials. So like some of the FASA mills that you published in your book, the images, like that art really called to mind some of the stuff that I was looking at. Um, so I have a short piece that I just finished that uh, was about that collection specifically and trying cool. to make the archives a little more visible. Okay, um, awesome, cool. Yeah, so I haven't thought about this specifically so much, although it did end up being this, why I'm doing some work around um, very, like just starting around um, like histories of Italian American anarchism and food. Okay, and I cool. think that that started with that one little section in Amazing. that piece where I talk about the um, the women who would gather trash. So super cool. And it was yeah. a seed. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I have so many follow-up questions about <laughs> that too. Yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but do you know Kate McKenney's book, Information Activism? Because um, I don't think I, I maybe do. I maybe was just actually flipping through that the other day. Because like, yeah. I mean, just in case in terms of like use of like newsletters and stuff, 
highly, wow. highly recommend as like a reference. And for other folks attending, like read our books, but also read that book. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. And I was, I really wanted to ask you, um, I have a bunch of questions I want to ask you, cool. but one of them was about how one thing I really loved about your book was the way that you didn't kind of, um, it's not like a hey geography, right. Of these restaurants. It's a really honest look at them. You talk very frankly about some of the shortcomings around class and race and about, you know, trans participants, um, and gender nonconforming participants. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what that process was like, because sometimes I think as queers, as feminists, as radicals, we want to be able to present this history that's like just cool, mm -hmm. but people aren't actually like that, right? We're like messy and complicated um, and we mess up. And so, yeah, I was just curious about your process of figuring out how to write about these restaurants, which were amazing places, while also writing about the ways in which they didn't, you know, they maybe weren't perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think it's like, as you said, it's complicated and it's especially complicated when you're doing oral histories, which are essentially interviews, right? So you actually get to know people. So you also wanna make sure like you wanna be respectful of them, but also tell parts of the history. I think part of it, so uh, I teach in a feminist studies program and I've been teaching like even when I was in grad school, TAing and teaching. And sometimes I would find that people would like talk really dismissively about the work that a lot of feminists did in the seventies and eighties because of its shortcomings. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I wanna show like, look, they've done amazing things, but they weren't perfect. And what we're doing now can be amazing, but also won't be perfect, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's not to let them off the hook for mistakes that they've made, because there were definitely mistakes. And the collectives themselves at the time would talk about these issues, you know? Like, I, I benefited from the fact that, for example, in Minneapolis, a woman's coffee house, during one meeting, they decided to set a tape recorder in the middle of the room during their discussion. And you could hear them discuss about racism in the coffee house and different people trying to think of solutions mm -hmm. and how to deal with this. And, you know, I think it's like, I benefited from hearing that. I think we do the past a disservice when we either paint it as completely broken or that we forget that the people we're talking about are complicated individuals who, yeah, they were running these coffee houses or these restaurants, but you know, they're also picking up groceries. They might've had kids or parents or doing caregiving. They might've been taking classes, you know, they went and saw movies, like they're complicated people. And I, mm -hmm. I want to show that complexity. I think it also makes it seem more possible to engage in these projects as well. If we realize that there are mistakes and we can learn from them and adjust, mm -hmm. and we'll have to keep doing that process. But yeah, some uh, sometimes it's really hard, especially for the folks that I got to know better over time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's nice to have that mixed method where I have the interviews and I can point to some things from the interviews, but I can also point to archives where the people aren't presently still living or aren't still presently running this space to point to other themes. It creates this kind of balance um, in which I can allow for that openness and conversation um, without being too, like, like not praising them too much, but also not dismissing their contributions too much. Totally. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That was something I really loved about it. And as I, I try to think through history in my own work, um, and I, yeah, I'm also, and I know you spoke a little bit about this earlier, but um, I, I am curious what personally sort of on an effective level drew you to these spaces, because I think sometimes it's really easy to, um, like sometimes these everyday spaces can feel really mundane, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they're so important, even though so much um, seems to have come out of them, right? But compared to like, um, you know, some of the more like, protest focus elements of the women's movement, of the queer liberation movement, of gay liberation movement, um, the restaurant or the third space or the coffee house can feel, you know, kind of like, why are we spending our time on this? And yet, as somebody who, you know, gr grew up spending a lot of time and, and thinking about growing up, like I'm probably still growing up. So early 20s too, in spaces like Firestorm and like Blue Stockings, um, thinking about the connections between those earlier restaurants and the spaces that exist now um, 
Yeah. And, and just wondering what you, what drew you to that? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So I think I have a two part answer. Mm -hmm. I think part of it was that, so I mentioned, I started this work in 2011 and I was out as bisexual, queer, like I came out as bisexual at the end of high school and started using the label also of queer, like during university. Um, but I didn't actually realize really until 2018 when I was wrapping up my like PhD that like, oh, this really was like me search, like instead of just mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. and that I was, I thought, oh, wow, these really were the spaces I was looking to find and couldn't find. It mm -hmm. is wild that it took me that long to dawn on me because I was out, but these spaces, some of them had alcohol, some didn't, but they were really about having like spaces that weren't centered on alcohol and mm -hmm. over like these kinds of queer spaces. And that was something I was looking for more in my life. And I do kind of laugh at myself because I even published an article called The Place You've Always Wanted to Go But Never Could Find, which was a line that a space in Toronto called Clementines actually used. So I don't talk about that in the book because this book really focuses mm -hmm. on the U.S. context. But so I think part of it was that I was writing through these spaces to kind of figure out where I wanted to be and kind of build community. So that's part of it. I think the other part of it is that while, you know, I've gone to many protests, many marches, enjoy that part of activism, but I do think that one thing I like about histories of cafes, coffee houses, also bookstores, I talk a bit about mm -hmm. bookstores, but it's not the emphasis of the book, is that these, these kinds of businesses are in this really kind of challenging position because our society is capitalist. And they're trying to deal with the everyday of needing to pay the bills mm -hmm. and function while also live through their feminist ideals. And so how they're trying to navigate that without making too many compromises, I think that's really appealing to me because that's something that even if I'm not running a business, is something that I still have to navigate in my day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. So I think trying to like work through like how can you be feminist under capitalism is really, you know, a challenge. And this is something that continues to be like a challenge for other kinds of feminist or social justice oriented um, businesses today and kind of spaces and organizations today. And to be clear for folks listening that haven't read the book yet, this kind of feminist restaurant isn't the same thing as like the girl boss feminism of like get to the top of the food chain and be the CEO. You know, it's, it's a very different way of trying to like think through feminism and capitalism. Oh. Yeah. And then I'm curious about the ways that you, or maybe some stories from interacting with the archives, because the archives are such a big part of this book. Um, you like really make them visible in the text that you're, you're drawing on archival documents. Awesome. I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay, I'm a huge <laughs> archive nerd. So for anyone um, listening who isn't into archives, um, I'm sorry, but <laughs> so one thing with the archival work that's like important to point out is that just in the same way that, uh, it's a challenge of like finding out histories of a place that was only open for six months or 18 months, right? Because not that much would be kept. There's also the kind of like biases in archives in terms of who was collecting, who thought something was valuable enough to keep. And so that's kind of an ongoing challenge um, with trying to do this research, right? Because whoever's doing the collecting has their biases, or if it's like a larger archive, like, you know, a lot of times they didn't even collect like queer history, feminist history, lesbian history. I'm not trying to be anachronistic with the word queer, but I'm just kind of using it as an umbrella to speak mm -hmm. to you right now. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, my work as a historian is I love going to the archives. Last week, it was our winter reading week for the university I work at. And I spent my whole like break going to archives and doing book talks because it's just my favorite thing. If you've never experienced it before for like I know you have run, but I mean, for folks listening, <laughs> um, I highly recommend seeking out your local LGBTQ archive because they're oftentimes community archives um, and oftentimes can be a bit more approachable. And you can like go through physical materials of past organizations or booklets or periodicals. Sometimes you can listen to like digital or audio kind of like media. It's 
it's amazing because that way you actually get to feel things from that time and read the handwriting. And, you know, one thing that I like about working from the 1970s, mostly until present day with my research, including my new book project I'm working on, is I can at least usually read the handwriting for folks who are trying to deal with stuff from like the 17th century. I just, it's so hard to read. So yeah. Yeah. Um, but archives have been really important in the work, but I tried to mix it up with also other um, materials because of those kind of uh, silences that can happen in archives too. Thanks. Yeah. Did you want to speak a little bit about your research methods for your piece within the anthology? Yeah, so I'm not formally trained in research. I come from, I actually um, studied nonfiction writing, so I come from more of that background and so I don't, a lot of my research, my piece in the anthology talks about my experiences um, going to Food Not Bombs on the Lower East Side in New York City when I was in high school and then sort of segues into the history of mutual aid in that neighborhood. Um, and so talks about community gardens, talks about um, Tompkins Square Park where a lot of, a lot of like really um, incredible protest movements happened, talks about all of these different aspects. Um, and so a lot of it was was book research, and it was mostly written during the beginning of COVID. So mm -hmm. it was me with like a bunch of articles, stringing things together. Um, and it would be amazing to to have been able to or to be able to um, do more sort of like interviews and and more extensive research on that. But it was definitely very much just a historical piece drawn from what I could find. Some of it was archival. Um, but archives that I could access digitally because it was it was during COVID. So yeah. And that's like another thing to point out for folks who maybe are excited by what we're talking about with archives is that um while many archives, you know, they won't maybe digitize like one percent of their collection or less, like there are a lot of amazing um resources out there with the lesbian her story archives, the CLBT, the GLBT Historical Society, the archives. The um, there's like the queer zine archives, like all of them have like digital materials. There's a bunch of different like radical and queer and anarchist archives that at least have some of their collection online. So I really encourage you to check that out just to be able to flip through all of these amazing resources and maybe it'll inspire you to go to physical archives sometime if that's exciting for folks. <laughs> and if not, okay, <laughs> that's cool too. Liberty, did you you said you had some questions you want to yeah. ask? Us. I'll I'll chime in a little bit. And actually, I want to pick up on a thread from earlier in the conversation, um, Alex, where you um, kind of brought up this question of like what makes food feminist, and I, I think mm -hmm. this can be like broadened out to be like what makes food, you know, feminist or radical, um, and and why talk about food, right? Like I think there is, you know, most histories of radical movements don't really even mention food so why why spend an entire book or two books on or, or, <laughs> or a hundred books on on this issue of of the food at play within movements for sure do you want me to start with kind of the feminist and the more specific and then run you take it like larger sure Bobby? yeah okay cool so yeah, I mean, and it's something you also talk about in your book run with like Sylvia Federici and, you know, the kind of like issues of like reproductive labor, like food is what underlies our society, right? And like everything is possible because we eat and we cook and eat that food. Um, and that's important labor. But for the purposes of my project, the way that I'm considering feminist food is really how the restaurants are seeing their food as feminist. And they do so through a variety of ways. One is like some of them, it was in terms of that they labeled the dishes as like, they would name their dishes after important feminist figures or important like people in their communities. And so in that way, it's kind of like marketing. But for some of them, it was about being vegetarian or later on vegan, um, kind of eating with the seasons. And so uh, I mentioned these restaurants were part of kind of a larger culture um, and like promoted different parts of culture, but they also produce their own books and pamphlets and so forth. And I have an example actually next to me. So 
Blood Root, the restaurant that I mentioned before, has published about nine cookbooks at this point, but their first cookbook they released in 1980 called The Political Palette. And I can just show folks right here, if you look on the screen, what it looks like. And so you'll also notice that the cover of my book is kind of modeled after it. Um, uh, but so the political palette, they speak really explicitly, the Blood Root Collective says really specifically about what they mean by feminist food. And the title even is a feminist vegetarian cookbook, like the political palette colon type of thing. Um, and so for them, it's about eating vegetarian because in this kind of eco-feminist way, they're connecting the oppression of animals with women's oppression um, in this kind of very 1980s um, eco-feminism. Um, exploitation of the land and women, um, they're seeing it as eating seasonally. Uh, and so the book is actually, the cookbook is broken into not just like four seasons, but like micro seasons as well. Um, and so while not every feminist restaurant produced its own cookbooks, though some did, many of them are vegetarian. This also has to do with in terms of like costs, like often their customers were women who had less money for food. Um, and it's also like vegetarian uh, items will last longer in your fridge, won't spoil, um, and also linked to kind of 1970s countercultural vegetarianist movements. So you've got this kind of vegetarian food. It's often that they're really trying to make sure that the farmers and the folks kind of producing the raw ingredients are paid well and are compensated, and that they'll be in solidarity with things like farm workers during Gallo grape, grape strikes. And when Anita Bryant is doing her anti-gay campaign in Florida, and who is the spokesperson of the Florida Citrus uh, Orange Board, uh, they like wouldn't sell orange juice. Uh, so there's kind of like, so there's an emphasis on making sure that the raw ingredients, the people producing them are paid well and there's worker solidarity. Then feminist food is also making sure that the people who work at the restaurant are paid properly. And like, they're not using the words living wage in the like 70s as much, but like that kind of idea of like a living wage. And then they want to make sure that the people in coming to the space could come and afford things. Um, and especially like the populations coming to these spaces were oftentimes uh, like working class or didn't have a lot of money to spend at restaurant. Now, as you can imagine, that's really hard to balance, right? It, I have this diagram of a triangle in the book, um, and it's something that uh, Lagusta Yearwood, who runs Lagusta's Luscious, kind of helped me think through. But, you know, you're trying to make sure the raw ingredients, the folks are paid well, try to make sure the workers in the restaurant are paid well, and you're trying to make sure that people can afford it. Well, that's really hard to balance. And so sometimes it would mean that uh, feminist restaurants and trying to have this kind of feminist food would end up actually not paying themselves well enough, or, um, you know, they would put in a lot of sweat equity, but they wouldn't like, like there would be suffering um, from the workers. Um, in order to kind of make this space possible. That usually led to burnout and failure and infighting. Not failure, but like the space closing. Because I actually try to say that spaces closing isn't the same thing as failure. Um, but some of them would try to compensate by having some like pay what you can items or sliding scale soup or socialist soup so that people still could sometimes come to the space. The one other thing that they kind of thought through with feminist space was that also there would be oftentimes big windows onto the kitchen. So kind of like an open, what we'd call an open concept there, big windows in order so that you wouldn't have that like hiding the labor of who was making the food. Most of them didn't have like waitresses and um, because they wanted to disrupt restaurant hierarchy. So it was, um, they wouldn't often have tipping because they wanted to disrupt that hierarchy and would have a jar to go to local organizations. So basically it was feminist food enacted in different ways, but oftentimes labor was a huge component of the dishes. And then sometimes it was also about making sure to cook dishes from a variety of different um, regions geographically around the world that represented the folks who work there's backgrounds and also um, the like foods kind of like local to the area that they were cooking in. So it's kind of a complicated answer, um, but it's basically feminist food is like, in some ways a representation of everything else happening in the restaurant and food is the thing that really like embodies it. And then there are some exceptions, but yeah. Yeah, um, I feel like I really came to this question of like what, you know, is food radical? Is food, can food be feminist? Can it be radical? Um, sort of a little bit um, 
from like the opposite framing. So more like I was more curious about where food shows up within these movements than, than starting with the food itself. And I think a lot of that just came from um, being part of anarchist and environmental direct action communities that had um, maybe sometimes like often very great people, but sometimes like a little bit of this patriarchal strain where, where that rep reproductive labor was minimized, you know? And um, noticing that, that, you know, we always had to eat. There were people always cooking food. There were people figuring out how to set up kitchens in the middle of the woods, but it was never being talked about. It was never being honored in this way. Um, and so I kind of started from there, from that question of like, why are we not talking about food? And there's lots of other, other things I could have um, looked at that we gloss over. It's just that like, I've been a restaurant cook for a long time. I love to cook or not. I haven't, I haven't been a restaurant cook for a long time, but a long time ago, I was a restaurant cook um, and I love to cook and I love food. Um, and, and so that kind of became my starting place to kind of see if, I and others that, because this book was so collaborative, it wasn't just me, it was so many people could make that tiny intervention where, where we could kind of say, you know, food is a part of these movements and a part of these projects. Um, and in terms of thinking about um, things like reproductive labor, I just wanted to mention the piece that Alex brought up is um, Notes on Utopian Failure and Communications by Madeline Lane McKinley, um, who also writes like really amazing stuff on like feminist stuff on comedy. So I would recommend checking out her work. Um, and then jumping back throughout the process of this project though, I feel like I learned so much from all of the contributors. And so there were things that, that are included in the anthology that have just like totally blown my mind and have totally changed how I think about food and politics. And one of the pieces that's included is actually an interview that's a reprint from Lao Son, which is um, an online website. And it is an interview with a project in Hong Kong called Black Window. And part of what they do is they have like a sliding scale cafe restaurant um, with differently priced items and um, it's collectively run. So, so a structure that's pretty similar to a lot of the restaurants and cafes that we've been talking about. Um, and that was like cool and exciting and what drew me in. But then there's this one paragraph in the interview that has really influenced my work since then um, at, as somebody who's like part of a collective where we do a lot of food stuff. And, you know, as somebody who like, I, you know, I like to put out little zines about food um, just sort of as like a fun thing to do. Uh, so if it's okay, I want to read, if I, it's okay that I read this paragraph, I'd love to share it because it just really influenced me. So in the restaurant, we've always treated food as a form of media, but one with its own material specificity. That's why when I cook dishes from the Middle East or India or Africa, it's not simply about exposing others to cooking cultures that are foreign from our own, but also about estranging myself from my own customary culinary habits, learning in a very material and tangible way about how other cultures relate to the preparation of food and the philosophy behind their handling of ingredients. I want to be respectful of that and ask that others are too, which is why I tend not to tone the food down and translate the dishes to suit local palates. There's also the fact that the food functions as a media in quite another way to alert people to what's going on around the world. If there's an upheaval in Lebanon or in Palestine or in Belarus, we might try our hand at learning how to prepare something from the region, accompanied with a post about what we think about this or that uprising. So that's something that's been really influential to me thinking about like how to bring food into things that are happening that are about like specific resistance movements around the world, so. That's amazing. And I mean, I love that piece. Like the two pieces you were just touching on were like some of my favorites in the book. And also when I was reading Madeline Lane McKinley's piece, that also reminded me of, there was this comic in the 1970s called Adventures of Altman, like Alternative Man. <laughs> and it's basically uh, this uh, woman is like cooking and cleaning for her family and Altman like flies in and is like, let me take you away from this drudgery. And he flies her to a commune. And then she's at the commune and she realizes that now she's just cooking like a lot of lentils, but she's not just cooking for her kids and her husband. She's now cooking for the entire commune. Mm -hmm. And she asked the men to like take part in the cooking. And they say, sorry, I need to write my manifesto about gender dynamics in the home. <laughs> and like they're all there, like all of them are like writing about how like, 
you know, they're all of their own political action and aren't doing that work. And then she says, oh no, I've left like this one life for this other one. And it's basically the same. Um, so I can try, I'll uh, send it to you. I had it in my like undergrad thesis, but it's just, it's a comic that sticks out to me all the time and just how so many different radical movements as you're talking about are oftentimes very unradical when it comes to kind of cooking and cleaning and the stuff that mm -hmm. keeps us alive. And so I really appreciate how a lot of the work in your um, anthology speaks to that. I think it's Thank also you. great that y'all both really, I mean, in some ways the like well, well like kind of worn territory is the kind of gendered and patriarchal like nature mm -hmm. of like food and reproductive labor. Um, and it's cool that both of your books acknowledge and and explore that but actually go in a different direction and look at like the liberatory potential of food um which i think is much less examined at least in popular literature that i've engaged with um but i don't know here hearing about the comic I, i'm reminded um of an anarchist gathering that i went to in north carolina probably mm, like 12 years ago uh, where there were workshops and then, you know, it was a gathering. So there's food that has been prepared for people. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, kind of going into lunch, there was like an announcement of like, here are the workshops that will be happening, you know, after lunch. And one of them was like, um, like feminism for men. Um, and, you know, so people were kind of like signing up for workshops and there was this like feminism for, for men workshop that was going to be happening after lunch. And so then after lunch, they announce where all the workshops are and they're like, all right, feminism for men is in the kitchen. You're going to be washing the dishes. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's, I think it's like, it's funny because we do, you know, the, I also think about like the crime think poster that like, I know at least Ren, you, you are familiar with, I'm sure of like kind of this, this theme of like who washes the dishes. I mean, it's kind of a related concept to, to who does the labor in the kitchen um, in terms of food preparation. And I know in like, in my experience, like this question of whether or not food preparation can be liberatory is like it's kind of a sticky one like um because i've i've always really valued and appreciated kind of the role of creating food for people and, and sharing meals as a form of like creating hospitality and like solidarity and at the same time it's super real that like anyone who has worked in food service has experienced food service as like mm -hmm. extremely oppressive e even if you love food um and like, I don't know, it's cool that Firestorm is in um, your book, Alex, but also I'm like, we, we aren't a cafe anymore. And one of the reasons why we stopped running a cafe, um, and it was it was not a sudden decision, it was sort of a gradual decision. But in 2018, we, we really were like, we're done. We're not running a cafe anymore. And one of the reasons is that we had a space where there were two registers, one for a bookstore and one for a cafe, and they were within eyesight of each other. And members of our collective could just watch the same customers be so lovely and pleasant and communicative in the bookstore mm -hmm. and then walk over to the cafe, same person, same day, same mood, and just be incredibly demanding and unpleasant to whoever was working in the in the cafe preparing, you know, coffee beverages or food items. And it just, I mean, it was kind of mind blowing because you don't normally get the chance to see in such stark relief the way that people behave towards kind of people doing this re reproductive feminized labor. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 there's so much I appreciate here about um, kind of like exploring the libertary like possibility and also acknowledging like many of the shortcomings and difficulties related to like food production. Yeah, definitely. I think with the thing about like the both that I wanted to highlight all the amazing things food can do because I also love to cook and I love being around food, but also my own work within the service industry um, <laughs> has also not always been the most pleasant and um, exploitative. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the other thing it kind of speaks to, because we're at like the eight o'clock mark too. And I saw that there was a question from an anonymous attendee, um, which was asking like what led them to close and at that particular time, I mean, this also speaks to the fact that like working in restaurants is really hard. And especially for the restaurants, I mean, Bloodroot has existed for 46 years. You can visit it. It's 
wild that it still exists in terms of that is a long time for a restaurant run by some of the same people to exist. But it's really hard work. Oftentimes it's pretty low paying for especially the kinds of restaurants that I'm talking about. They're not supported by multinational food groups with celebrity chefs. You know, that's like a different kind of restaurant industry, which has its own levels of exploitation and all of that. But, you know, most of the people working in these places were living like very um, like day to day in order to keep this functioning. And at a certain point, some of the places, even if they could continue to function, they just got burnt out or they wanted to do something new. There's a story with um, Mother Courage. Someone wrote up the, a time that they went to New York City and they're so excited to visit Mother Courage because they had read about it in a bunch of different feminist periodicals. And it was kind of a place where like there's a who's who about uh, who would go there. And there are all these kind of feminist celebrities at the time that'd be pictured going there. And so someone was really excited to go. They show up, it's a snowy night and there's a note on the door that says, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and it was just closed, you know? And it's like, sometimes that also would happen. There's also the, like with kind of like the end of the eighties into the nineties, right? There's changes in the economy. It's harder to run these independent businesses. Um, and just like the instability just sometimes became too much for folks. Um, yeah, I mean, some of them would end quite quickly because of lack of communication um, having that hard time of balancing who's doing the kind of grunt work in the kitchen and the grunt work of cleaning versus other kinds of tasks. Um, but yeah, but also the parallel story is that like if this were even just a restaurant history of restaurants from the 70s to today a lot of them wouldn't still exist because it's so difficult. Yeah, there's not a lot of restaurants that were around in the 70s still in operation, so it's an incredible achievement. There is mm -hmm. a question in the Q&A, um, uh, which I think is a good piggyback, which is this kind of um, thing that you brought up earlier where you said that um, you have kind of wanted Alex to reframe the closure of restaurants as not necessarily like uh, uh, synonymous with failure, Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, the person in the Q and A is asking, um, kind of what uh, what criteria for success, um, kind of do you explore in your work? Yeah, I would say that they're successful in the way of kind of modeling what kind of possibilities um, there are in trying to create feminist businesses, um, and also showing like what isn't possible too, or like the kind of ongoing challenges that we still see today. They were successful in that. Like for example, so Brick Hut um, was a space in the Bay Area, in the Berkeley area. And uh, when I was starting to do research, I found on Facebook a remembrance group for this restaurant. It's called Remembering the Brick Hut. And it's been closed for decades. And yet there's still a community of people who go on Facebook and write about their memories from the space and still connect on that space. And, you know, it's sometimes people ask questions about like, does anyone have the recipe for those home fries? But also people share memories of like bringing their friends there when they were about to pass away from complications of HIV AIDS and having their last meal there and really building family and community there. And so these were spaces where people could work out as like lesbians or also leaders like with queer identities. There are places where people could socialize with others and not have to like mask parts of their identity necessarily. And so they were really important on kind of individual impact level, but they also allowed a lot of different musicians and people in the trades and artists a place to kind of hone their crafts and share their work and build out their own kind of like uh, livelihood as well. So I think those were important impacts. And then there's also this kind of generational impact in that. So I mentioned Augusta Yearwood a bit earlier. And so she's a feminist, vegan, anarchist chocolate maker in New Paltz, New York, and runs a few different uh, chocolate businesses. And she was going to culinary school and she did her stage um, at Bloodroot, actually. Like she did her kind of like internship at Bloodroot and worked with them on the development of some cookbooks. And since then, she has all these different businesses and she's written her own cookbooks. And so you kind of see this like impact of like, you know, Lagosta runs her businesses differently than Bloodroot, but like there's still this kind of um, impact in terms. So I think all of those are successes, um, but you know, sometimes people view the success a bit differently than at the moment. 
there were some interviews with folks who I talk about this one person, Marjorie Parsons, who was part of the Common Woman Club in Northampton, Massachusetts. And she gave a talk to this group of women in Somerville, Massachusetts, who are interested in starting potentially a feminist restaurant. They eventually started a coffee house, but they invited a few different like women in feminist business and stuff to come in and talk to them. And they tape recorded these meetings. And I found these tapes in uh, Northeastern University's archives, um, which was really amazing to listen to. And that was the collective, the initial collective burned out in around 18 months. And she talks about all the challenges they faced. But at the end, there's this moment in her talk after talking about all these stresses about money and all this infighting. And she says, like, for a while, there was a place where I could be an like out lesbian and live out my values. And now the new collective that's taken over the space that's like running the business a bit differently. They also had this space. And she says, like, it like brings me to tears to know that this was possible. So even for people who felt that burnout, just the fact that they knew that they were able to make this happen for some point in their lives continued to move them. Um, I think that in itself is a success. But Ren, I'm wondering for you, like how how this question of success pans out within the stories um, in the anthology. Yeah, I'm trying to think, um, you know, like so many of the pieces in the anthology are about moments or projects that are ephemeral or projects that arose because, you know, there was a protest movement going on or um, there was, you know, like a need for mutual aid during COVID or during some other time. And so I, it's hard for me to think about that because, and also very few of the, um, of the projects that are spoken about in the anthology are businesses. And so from my perspective, at least, and from, from what people have written about, the success is really like the doing of the thing, right? Is, is um, having those pop-up kitchens in Delhi during the Shaheen Ba women's movement protests, um, which uh, a writer named Purdy Gupta writes about, or, you know, having these kitchens that pop up during disasters, um, or, you know, creating these community gardens, some of which don't last forever, but like while they do last, are able to, you know, feed um, feed neighbors in, in areas that might be food deserts or might, might have um, experienced a lack of access to food due to like racism and classism, um, which Mayam talks about a lot in this interview on farming as a practice of abundance and liberation. Um, and so I think success, at least in, at least in my mind or, or my perspective from from the um, work of the individuals who contributed to the anthology is just that, you know, that idea that these things were possible and they maybe won't continue forever or weren't intended to continue forever, but they existed at some time and they showed a world that um, was different than the one that so many of us are living in on a day to day basis. So, Yeah. And my, in in my experience, the people who run these pop up kitchens, and you know, like you said, at like protests, and I mean, um, or or for disaster relief, there's such a culture around it. I feel like it's mm -hmm. it is such an identity, you know. Of it's not it's not just people who like, you know, everybody draws straws, and some people like run the you know run the like the food bus. It's people who really have like cultivated incredible skill and relationships and resources and it's it's there's something very enchanting about it for sure and I know as someone who doesn't like to show up to a space and not have a role or like something to do mm -hmm. like being like you know let, let's go chop veggies in the kitchen and then inevitably there's a community around that I mean you know mm -hmm. you get to the kitchen and you're chopping carrots but you're also part of the culture and the conversation that oftentimes is really it's both part of the larger like movement, but also so distinct. Um, and I think that, uh, I don't know, it can really shape your experience of those spaces. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so both of y'all's books uh, kind of end up talking a lot about food in relationship to like criminalized identities, um, which I thought was kind of like an interesting thing. And, uh, You've already talked a little bit about oral history and archival research, uh, but I am I'm curious if you'd be interested in saying a little more about um, kind of uh, 
how uh, why oral history is so important when you're looking at criminalized histories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, both in the case of uh, Alex, like looking at like queer folks who maybe had to code their like restaurants and guidebooks, um, you know, using the term women uh, instead of the term lesbian. Um, you, you also mentioned, I think, in the introduction that the history of the like, like uh, LGBT, like bar scene is like often kind of written about as like a criminalized history, which makes a lot of sense. And then Ren, at the same time, I think there's a very different type of criminalization that shows up again and again um, in your anthology. Um, and one that um, I think is familiar to folks living in Asheville uh, in some, some of some pieces of it. I mean, obviously there's lots of different types mm -hmm. of criminalization, but the way in which the actual distribution of food itself can be criminalized. Um, right now in Asheville, uh, we've got um, more than a dozen people facing felony charges actually who are part of a group mm. that started uh, out distributing food um, primarily to unhoused folks during the pandemic as a form of mutual aid. Um, ended up doing uh, more like, like camp defense work and were eventually uh, kind of like swept up in this um, kind of a police action, arresting people kind of for being in parks after hours and charging people with felonies, which is wild. And this all happened in parallel to discussion at the city council level about the criminalization of food distribution. I think they were, uh, they had drafted legislation uh, requiring permits to distribute food in the parks here in Asheville. And thankfully that was leaked to the public before they managed to, to like kind of like workshop it and get everybody on the same page. And there's a huge backlash. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that question of criminalized identities and oral histories and um, yeah, any thoughts there? I mean, one thing I saw in your book, Ren, too, when you were talking about like food, not bombs and the criminalization, it also brought to mind, um, you know, I mean, I participated a little bit with food, not bombs when I was at Wesleyan in Connecticut. But at that time, um, Abe Bobman, who was at Wesleyan and really involved and was like really connecting with Keith of Food Not Bombs, like he was arrested several times for distributing mm -hmm. food. And it went to the Connecticut, um, so like the, the highest level of court in Connecticut and became like a huge deal about like distributing food and food being a right. Um, and I think, you know, those events happening around me and knowing Abe through the farm and through Food Not Bombs and kind of uh, that community also had probably a big impact in how yeah. I was thinking about food. Um, but for this, so, um, but for the question about kind of, I, maybe I'll go back to the oral history after, because I feel like Ren has so much to say probably about this <laughs> kind of question of criminalization. And then I can circle back to oral history after if that works. Yeah, totally. I was actually going to jump in thinking about the oral history stuff, um, but if folks aren't familiar with um, with it, there's actually a long history of, of food not bombs and other, as Liberty was talking about, other sort of like public food, free food serving um, organizations and projects being criminalized, arrested. Um, there's an amazing flyer that is uh, from an older, you know, in the 1980s early iteration of food not bombs. That's like if the police start taking your food and it is like a guide of what to do if the police start taking the food. But then like one of the things I'm paraphrasing, but one of the things is like have backup food because they'll feel really silly if they have to keep taking the food. Um, and so, yeah, this is, has been a part of of um, food based mutual aid projects forever and really is is about the criminalization of public space right so we haven't seen where i live in tucson we haven't necessarily seen food not bombs or other projects of sharing food being criminalized but we are seeing these um huge sweeps of encampments of houseless folks and this push to get them out of of public space that they've been living in oftentimes creating their own communities in little pockets of tucson for a long time um, so it feels like it, it is all about like how public space can be used and who public space is for um, and these these broader things like gentrification and thinking about things like oral histories. I just um, I don't know if I mentioned this. I'm, I'm currently in school studying library science, with the focus on archives. We were talking about this a little bit before the presentation started, but um, if it feels as though 
you know, so little of what ends up in archives, it's pretty rare to find stuff that's not from this powerful institutional perspective. And the archivists that have saved things like the like newsletters and literature that Alex is working off of have done amazing work. Um, and that's so valuable and important. And it, it sometimes feels like if, um, if we don't get these oral histories down, you know, when they're appropriate, not, not everything that everyone's doing, they want recorded, but, but when it's okay, you know, if we don't get these down, then they're lost and we don't have these histories to look back on and build off of. Um, and so that's actually like a huge impetus for, for me starting the interview series, but then also for wanting to edit an anthology of written pieces was like, how can we keep these stories in some sort of form that they're accessible to people in the future? Yeah, definitely. And with the oral histories, right? So like it also fills in some of those like archival gaps that we have. I mean, like that's basically like what mm -hmm. Ren was talking about, right? And then, um, you know, one thing that it can be really valuable too is that sometimes oral histories are then deposited to archives. So I conducted a lot of um, original oral history interviews for this book but I also benefited from some previously done oral histories from folks who had passed away before I even started this project. Um, and in one of those oral histories, there's an interview um, related to Mother Courage. And this was really important because it was about how um, Mother Courage did essentially, like they, want, they didn't have enough money to just start the space themselves. And so they um, were working with like, their friends and their community for people to give them kind of tiny loans that they plan to pay back within a short period of time. And because of their connections um, with local journalists, uh, one kind of wrote about like this idea of like kind of microfinancing this place or kind of crowdfunding the space or doing like my mini loans for the place. And how maybe this is like a new way we can found like women's movement projects and this article was really excited but this actually brought um like regulators down on the founders of mother courage who were saying like hey you're breaking the law you're not doing these things right we're going to arrest you you have to return the money right so even just like any attention on trying to form a business in a new way brought on this regulation another place where um kind of this this tension with kind of government officials and issues, not necessarily in criminalization, but like these restaurant founders facing like legal barriers was around uh, zoning permits and the ability to also get liquor licenses. Basically any time that they had to um, kind of come into contact with like regulatory bodies, that's when there was strife. So many of them would try to avoid that and so would choose not to serve alcohol just so they didn't even have to try to deal with that force. Um, and as Liberty was saying, a lot of that history of, especially when I started the project, a lot of the histories kind of around um, lesbian bars was really kind of focused on especially kind of working class lesbian bars um, in the 40s and 50s. And that was really a history of like, uh, crimin like how it's written is really a history of like kind of criminalization and the way that like the police interacted with these spaces. And we even see that like going further in a history, kind of newer histories of um, lesbian bars that have been coming up are, are having a little bit of a different focus, but there's still kind of like that underwriting current of the work. So I think um, that, and also one other time I can think of like off the top of my head in my book is that um, some of these spaces, you know, there was like a sign on the door and like when Selma Miriam started Bloodroot, um, her mom said, there's no way you can put feminists in the title. You're going to get a brick through the window on the first day you open, you know? And that never actually happened for them. Uh, but in some spaces and some places, it wasn't possible for there to be a sign. And I have an example um, of this tiny uh, women's coffee house in a small town in Minnesota that take place in a um, cookie bakery after hours. And many of the, it was about 15 women would meet up and, uh, you know, they would eat the leftover cookies and hang out. 
but you know, they could have like the blinds closed and stuff like that because many of them were school teachers. And if it was known that they were lesbians, they'd be fired from their job, right? So again, the way that like the law isn't protecting like lesbians and queer workers, um, that's kind of where it comes up. And I learned about that also through um, uh, an oral history project that is housed at the Treader, and those are digitized too. So um, yeah, so I also want to shout out the amazing um, work of other historians in collecting these oral histories and making them available. Um, and there's this uh, kind of like, there's the LGBTQ digital collaboratory, which links about a bunch of other like oral history projects that are LGBTQ centered. So if people are looking for resources to find out about others, in like especially different like localized areas that's a great resource for doing so Alex did I see that you did or were doing an event at the lesbian archives in New York oh so I uh so yeah so last Friday I spoke at blue stockings but during the day I went to the lesbian history archives just to do some research cool. on my third book project oh that's awesome cool yeah, that's a really but... incredible space it was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I loved being there. So yeah, it was awesome. Um, so we're, we're getting close to the end of our time together. Um, and uh, Heather in the Q&A uh, had, I think, a fun question for us, which is, <laughs> um, uh, it was directed specifically to Ren, but I think this is a universal question um, uh, to kind of share a favorite dish. Uh, I guess this is a callback, Ren, to your um, recurring mm -hmm. interview question. Totally. I don't think it was entirely a fair question for me to ask because I'm someone who's like incapable of having favorites, <laughs> but, um, yeah, thinking about it, I think the general, I, um, I make my own pasta from scratch and I think pasta is a really cool food that has a lot of really interesting histories about it. Um, and everything from there's this pasta called Capolacci de Briganti, which is in the shape of these hats that were worn by um, brigands in Southern Italy who um, have been cast as sort of like robbers, highway robbers, and some of them were, but um, but there's this whole stratum of like peasants who were resisting um, the unification of Italy and takeover from, from sort of the wealthier North um, that get lumped into that, right? So there's this long history, this long, very complex history of resistance. And there's this pasta shape that that actually is a nod to the hats of the brigands, um, to things like um, the fact that there was this whole strain where like the fascists in Italy really hated pasta because they thought it would like slow down. Um, you know, they thought it was feminist and or feminine and slow and they were, you know, all about machines and fast and all these really creepy fascist stuff. Um, and so making pasta became sort of a form of resistance. So yeah, there's a lot of really interesting histories around pasta that I really like to nerd out about. Um, so I think like, I know that's a category of food, but I would say that that's my favorite. Awesome. Okay. I think I might answer this in terms of like what my favorite like dishes from a feminist restaurant cookbook mm. <laughs> because I mean I love tacos more than anything and I kind of put anything in a corn tortilla like for many meals a day <laughs> but um in terms of like but I don't think that's as exciting of an answer except for that I grew up in Southern California and I just love to put everything in a tortilla um but in turn because that's the food that's most comforting to me but um, there's this recipe for chocolate devastation cake from Bloodroot. And uh, this recipe has been really important to me because so I was like this keen undergrad. I'd written my thesis. I like, brought copies for Selma, Miriam, and Noel Fury, who have been part of Bloodroot since 1977, 1978. Noel joined a few months after the collective started. So I think we could say she was like an original, but, <laughs> um, and I brought them a copy and I was really kind of like nervous and they gave me a piece of the cake as like the celebration of it being over. And then when I had to defend my PhD, so at the end of the PhD, you know, you send courses and exams, and then you spend years writing this long thing, and then you have to defend it in front of people who ask you questions for hours about it. Um, and I didn't tell my supervisor I was going to do this, but I actually, the chocolate devastation cake is, is has a sourdough base, which is 
a little bit rare for a cake. And I use my own sourdough starter that I've been taking care of for years. And I like, as I had been kind of nurturing my dissertation and I use that to make the chocolate devastation cake, but as cupcakes. And when I got to the defense, I served them to the committee, um, partly bribing them, but also to show the importance of food um, and kind of having this embodiment. Uh, so for me, that's like a really kind of important uh, dish. That's amazing. That, <laughs> and it also like, I, I don't know if I've ever tried a sourdough cake. It's, it's very tasty, highly oh. recommend. And I mean, if you already have the starter, you're like, you know, if you have to start the start, if you have to start the starter, then it's going to be a, you know, long process to get this cake. But if you have some starter, it's a fairly, fairly simple recipe and it's really uh, tasty, even without the frosting, actually. I kind of like it even better without the frosting. So I would recommend that. Fancy fascist pasta and sourdough <laughs> cake, y'all started here <laughs> first. Um, so we're we're closing in. Do y'all have any final final thoughts or anything you want to go out on? Well, I would encourage people to read Ren's book. It's great. I'm teaching. I always teach a. I've been teaching an every other year a food, gender, and environment course, but I want to teach a, a feminist food kind of more lecture course instead of a conference next. Uh, next fall. And I'm really excited to use some of Ren's book in that class. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty excited. Um, the essays and pieces in it are fantastic. So I hope people, I hope people read that book and yeah. <laughs> and likewise, I've been recommending Alex's book to lots of people just in my everyday life. And I would strongly, strongly suggest reading it. Um, and also, yeah, I, I, um, so grateful for all the contributors to the anthology. They produced amazing work. Um, so really encourage you not just to read this uh, book, but read their other work as well. So. And thank you, Firestorm and Liberty yeah. for, uh, for moderating and having us and doing all the lovely promotion and everything. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, yes, thank awesome. you so much. This has been a lot of fun. And my only regret is that we couldn't do it in person with food, which mm. would have been so much. Um, so perhaps we'll get another chance uh, to, to do an in-person activity in the future. Uh, maybe not all three of us at the same time, but certainly uh, please let us know um, if there's a chance where we can host and do an additional follow-up conversation with food present uh, <laughs> at Firestorm's new location when we move this summer. So I think on that note, uh, our time together is over. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you all again soon. Please do pick up these books. They're fantastic reads. Awesome. And order them from Firestorm. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please do. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thank Take you care. so much. All Bye. right. Good night.